Hello everyone, this is Peter Svidler with uh, the highlight video from round three of Altibox Norway Chess Tournament 2018. Uh, the choice for game of the day is uh, quite obvious. There was one decisive game that round and it was, uh, we felt, uh, a game interesting enough and uh, deserving enough uh, to dedicate our res day uh, to uh, speaking about it, which, as you obviously can appreciate, is a huge sacrifice. Joking aside, uh, both uh, Jan and I were hugely impressed by uh, what happened in the game between Magnus Carlsen and Levon Aronian yesterday, and uh, we, we did feel like not doing a video on this game would be doing <clears throat> A disservice to the people who may have missed the show. So without further ado, let's uh, uh, start talking about the actual game. Uh, Magnus was white against Livon. In round two all five games were drawn and in round one uh, Magnus won a very uh, interesting game against Fabiano Caruana, obviously a huge talking point because they will meet uh, in November in the World Championship much later this year. So uh, clearly every encounter between them, and I'm not sure if there will be many more encounters between them this year, uh, uh, <clears throat> assumes greater significance with the match uh, looming very large. Uh, therefore the tournament situation was Magnus on plus one, the entire field on 50%, and Fabi in clear last on minus one. And this is uh, uh, round three. Magnus, uh, as usual, goes 1e4. Lev, as usual, replies with 1e5. Knight of 3, knight c6. Uh, bishop b5, knight of 6. Uh, Lev also plays a lot of uh, a6 uh, Spanish, but uh, he chooses uh, to go back to the tried and tested, so to speak, and uh, uh, returns to uh, to the Berlin for this game, which is understandable because uh, it, it, you, both the Berlin proper and the anti-Berlins have been doing exceptionally well recently. But Magnus came very well prepared and I will uh, speak a bit la later on in the video about just uh, how impressive uh, this bit of preparation was from Team Magnus and why I think it was so impressive. Castles, Knight takes e4. Uh, and rook e1, which is something that Magnus has been doing uh, a lot against the Berlin, not the d3, c3 anti-Berlins, but this particular type of anti-Berlin. But it has been recently doing extremely well for black, and black has been largely untroubled, I want to say, uh, in, in recent practice uh, in these positions. But Magnus still goes for it, and we were mildly curious uh, during the live show uh, uh, exactly what is he planning to show here uh, after bishop e7, bishop f1. I mentioned briefly that Lev used to play knight f5 in this position, but then after knight f3, the simplest way to, explore, to, to describing this will, would be uh, exactly what Jan said during the live show. Uh, simply put, there are more pieces left on the board compared to what you will see later in the game. And that, of course, gives white a bigger scope for uh, looking for an advantage. But these days everybody takes only five, rook e5, castles, d4. There's also, of course, a lot of theory here connected with knight c3. For instance, knight e8, knight e5, bishop d6, rook e1, and so on. Uh, but this uh, has been more or less exhausted and is, I think, these days supposed to be a draw in more than one way. So Magnus goes d4, bishop f6. In his world championship match against uh, Sergei Kayakin, he once played rook e2 in this position, but this has not really reappeared in top grandmaster practice since. So he goes rook e1. And this is a, a moment I want to stop on uh, uh, because there are two, you know, very large diverging ideas here for black. One is to play knight f5, which is something that uh, Lev uh, did in that game against Magnus. And the other is to play rook e8, which is, has a, its own huge body of theory. And frankly, uh, it's been a while, at least in my mind, since White uh, has shown anything at all in those positions. They are currently, I think, doing extremely well for Black. Black is uh, 
equalizing uh, reasonably comfortably there. At least that was my understanding. But Levon, uh, either because he found something there, I couldn't obviously rule that out. I, I am not the world's biggest authority on these lines. I am more of a bystander. Uh, or maybe because he just thought that knight of five uh, equalizes easier, or maybe even gives black a chance to uh, have a lively position where, you know, his biggest ambition is not just to trade everything along the e-file, but maybe there will be some double-edged play. He has been playing knight f5 recently. For instance, he did this and equalized very, very comfortably in his game against Fabiano in the recently concluded Baden-Baden round-robin tournament. Uh, therefore, Magnus' decision to uh, go for this and to have an idea here was based not only on the state of the opening uh, in its entirety, so to speak, but also very precisely on what Levon has been doing uh, very recently. And it paid off because Levon decided to repeat exactly what he did against Fabi, and uh, why wouldn't he? He was very untroubled in that game. Knight f5, uh, white goes d5. Uh, if you play c3 instead, black plays d5. And this is, once again, this is an, your, your typical rook one anti-Berlin position where, you know, the structure is very symmetrical and margins are extremely small for white to prove he has anything at all. After d5, at least it's not as as completely symmetrical as, as all that. Rook e8, and Fabi played bishop d3 in this position, to which Lev replied by taking and playing queen e7, and the game continued takes, takes, d6, cg, knight a3, and Lev immediately uh, returned his extra pawn by playing uh, d5 and d6, and uh, equalized very, very comfortably here. The game was... Uh, drawn 15 moves later, but uh, it was in effect completely drawn within the next five moves or so. Uh, instead of all that, uh, in this position Magnus takes on e8 and goes queen d3. And this looks very, very uh, non-threatening at first glance because, you know, you could make an argument that black has better development here. He has two pieces out and his queen is on uh, on the open file, whereas white currently has nothing developed. But White has, you know, a glimmer of hope for the future because he has the spatial advantage based basically on this pawn on d5 and the fact that Black will at some point play d7, d6 and uh, the pawn on d5 does give White uh, more space in the center and on the queen side and uh, if he stabilizes and manages to get all of his pieces out and in particular if he manages to assume control over the open e-file he will have uh, a nice, nice stable advantage. But it's not immediately clear if uh, he will be able to do all that. d6 is the most natural reply, and here Magnus played knight g2. It's also possible to play knight c3, uh, but uh, it gives black the additional option of playing queen e1, which uh, during the live show we thought this was very strong. As a matter of fact, Computer seems to suggest that after knight e4, bishop e5, and a very quiet move c3, white already is threatening uh, to play rook b1 followed by bishop d2, which would uh, be a very large problem for black because his queen on uh, e1 would be more or less uh, more or less caught if he allows that, which is why uh, black probably has to play bishop f4 here, to which white replies knight d2. It seems passive, but it does create a very strong threat of knight f3, and the positions arising here are actually very similar to what the players eventually got in the game. For instance, to stop knight f3, white can, black can play knight h4, to which white probably replies knight b3, uh, rook c, uh, bishop c1, rook c1. And this is exactly the type of structure that they had in the game. Arguably, black is probably doing slightly better here than in the game because the knight is already uh, getting rerouted to much better squares than he was originally. I mean, it was originally, and... I would probably prefer this to what uh, Lev got in the game. But it's still, uh, I mean, white remains uh, somewhat better due to the fact that the rook on e8 is a bit stuck, and uh, as mentioned, white has more space on the queen side. Um, but knight d2, the move that uh, Magnus chose, is aiming to even not allow queen e1 at all, because obviously if you play queen e1 here, it just gets immediately driven away by knight of knight f3, and uh, it's just a waste of a tempo. 
And the move that Lev chose here, uh, I praised fulsomely during the live show, but it probably was a, a significant mistake. I think my assessment of the resulting position was just incorrect. I, I kept on saying that yes, currently white quite clearly is better because uh, as you will see in about three moves time, um, and the move, I, I, I should actually say which move Lev made. My, Lev played bishop g5, using the fact that the knight is currently in transit, sort of from b1 to the good squares on either e4 or f3, and that allows black uh, this very uh, immediate opportunity to play bishop g5 and trade off a pair of bishops, uh, which seems very useful, limiting the number of uh, pieces on the board and, and generally trading off one of your pieces, which in particular, if the knight reaches the e4 square, it would have to look for um, good squares in the center, and it's not immediately clear that it would find good squares in the center. But the position that Lev got after knight f3, bishop c1 and rook c1, followed by rook e1, it turns out that it is a lot more venomous for black than I originally assumed. I kept on saying during the live show that, yes, <clears throat> Black will be stuck to the protection of the c7 pawn, the queen most likely will have to go to g8 and stay on d8 for the foreseeable future, which means that the rook on a8 is not really participating in the game. But I was pretty sure that black with correct play should be able to somehow reorganize his pieces, get those pieces out of the corner. And if you ever imagine uh, this rook on a8 actually landing on e8 without black losing any material on the queen side. The game becomes more or less immediately completely equal because black has a very very solid structure and the one arguable weakness which is the pawn on c7 is on a dark square and white has a light squared bishop which means that uh, putting any pressure on it apart from attacking it with the queen and black defending it with a queen would be completely impossible and white doesn't really have any more targets to play against. But as it turns out, uh, just saying that black will find a way to uh, alleviate that pressure is not enough to make it true. And uh, black is actually worse and has to uh, make concessions to even get out of the corner. In view of all that, after knight g2, uh, it was probably much better to start playing concretely immediately by playing c6, challenging this pawn on d5, and being very prepared to just take on d5 and play this position with an Isolani on d6, much like the kind of a structure that Magnus himself got against Sergei Karakin in round two. But this will give uh, black, in particular the bishop on c8, will finally have some squares on c6 or e6 to look forward to. For instance, in the line after uh, knight e4, bishop e5, let's say white goes c3, black takes and plays bishop d7. And black is not even remotely worse here because bishop d7, c6 is a very large uh, idea for black. It's probably slightly better for white to start with c3 without giving black all this tempi with knight e4. But even here, let's say we take, take, we play, queen c6, the queen, the queen c6, the queen goes back, and black plays something like uh, h6 or g6, probably something like h6, followed by bishop e6. And we end up uh, in, in a kind of a position which you often see, let's say, in the uh, knight d2, in the Tarash uh, French, after knight d2, c5, e d5, e d5. The pawn probably will go to d5 at some point, so it's exactly the same structure. Where, yes, uh, if white manages to somehow assume control over the d4 square, he will have some push, but uh, practice shows that these positions are uh, very holdable, and uh, uh, this wouldn't have been uh, a disaster at all for, for Lev to, to, to get this. But he, I assume, also somewhat underestimated the danger he was in after bishop g5. Bishop g5, knight f3, takes, takes, left played bishop d7, rook e1, the queen did go to d8. It was possible to play queen f8 with the idea of immediately playing c6 after queen c4. And of course queen c4 has to be played because you do not want to allow the rook to reach the e8 square. So you play queen c4 here, and black can play either c5 or c6, to which white will reply by 
uh, let's say, taking and playing bishop d3. And once again, it feels uh, that black is, you know, one better square for the piece away from being completely equal. But he is actually some way away from that. The knight on f5 is extremely awkwardly placed. The queen on f8 is not really participating in the action. And as you can see, the entire pawn structure black has on the queen side is rather weak. So this is not a pleasant position to find yourself in. Uh, and it's understandable that Lev did not really uh, I feel like entering any of this uh, until it arguably was a bit too late. He played queen d8, Magnus once again goes queen c4. Uh, this, has a, has, this move has a double purpose. It uh, opens up the d3 square for the bishop and it also uh, keeps an eye on the c7 pawn, making sure that the queen, for instance, doesn't jump out to f6, which would be a very, very good square for that piece. Black plays g6. Uh, once again, uh, it has to be said that the knight on f5 currently has no future at all, and Lev is uh, aiming to reroute it towards uh, better squares. In particular, maybe placing it on e8 would um, lessen the pressure on the c7 pawn and allow the, uh, allow the queen to get active. But still, it has to be a rook on e8 for black to equalize, and if you bring the knight there, it once again, it's, it, it is one more piece that is occupying uh, uh, the square that is needed for the rook. h3, uh, this move will become useful later. It's, uh, you're creating luft for your king, but also, as you will see later in the game, it makes sense to prepare uh, to restrict this knight on g7 uh, even more. Uh, if the opportunity arises. Knight g7, rook e3. This, of course, is not an invitation to repeat with knight f5, because after knight f5, the rook can go to c3 or b3, creating uh, additional problems for black. And the knight can always be uh, chased away by g2, g4 later. Uh, Lev replied by playing a5, and this already probably is uh, the start of a wrong approach. It was time to admit that there is no good way for black to, to deal with the fact that the queen side is constantly under pressure here. He should have played c6. And uh, the resulting position is uh, not very attractive, but compared to what he got uh, later in the game, I think this has to count as an improvement. He takes c6, and you can take with the pawn, or you can even maybe take with the bishop and go after knight g4, go queen d7, and of course this is not equal, but uh, because of how little material is left on the board, you can perhaps hope to uh, hold it with uh, accurate defense, and you will have to defend it accurately and for a very long time against somebody like Magnus. a5 perhaps was connected with a dream of playing a4 followed by rook a5 and rook c5, but of course Magnus was not going to allow that, he goes a4. And once again, somewhere here, black could maybe play c6. Maybe this is uh, arguably even an, an improved version, because in all those same positions, the pawn on a4, uh, the bishop on c6 will be kind of looking at the pawn on a4 and giving, giving black some targets for counterplay. Instead, left spent two tempi on playing knight e8. Once again, sort of hinting he wants to go queen f6. Magnus played queen f queen d4. Uh, stopping queen f6 because of a very simple rook takes c8 tactic. <clears throat> and Lev just went knight g7 back. Once again, probably it was better to do something else, but giving good advice in this position is already quite difficult. Uh, so Lev played knight g7, and it was met by uh, g2, g4. And this position uh, probably is already quite difficult for black. Uh, the pawn on g4 very, very efficiently uh, restricts both the bishop on d7 and the knight on g7. And white has a very simple, very straightforward plan of playing queen f4, knight g5, knight e4, and starting direct uh, direct uh, operations against the black queen, uh, king side. And black is so discoordinated here that it is actually very, very difficult to uh, stop this from happening. Perhaps understanding that left played c6, and uh, 
uh, in the studio, we immediately became very excited about some concrete moves like bishop c4 or maybe d takes c6 and, and bishop c4. And they are very strong, but they are somewhat uh, unmagnus like because uh, uh, they would allow uh, black to actually get this knight out of the corner. And the computer suggests that this position is actually very, very poor for black. And it's not very surprising because the whole dark square complex on the king side is still very weak and something like knight g2, knight e4 might just win the game if it's allowed. But currently the knight on g7 and the bishop on d7 have no, no squares and it is very understandable that Magnus decides to just continue restricting them to uh, keep the, the pawn on g5 alive and uh, once again deny black any kind of active counterplay at all. This position probably already is very, very difficult for Black to play, and his situation was not improved by the fact that uh, he was running significantly short on time. Uh, some kind of a waiting move like Rook C8 may have been objectively stronger than what Levon did, but Levon continued looking for ways to uh, generate at least some kind of play. So he goes Knight E8, perhaps hoping to now land this Knight on F6, and from this moment on, um, Magnus played very energetically. He played queen f4 here. Once again, of course, queen f6, rook takes e8 is impossible. And uh, knight f6 runs into numerous problems here. Knight g5 is very strong. Even knight d4 is very strong here with a very simple idea after c takes d5 of playing rook f3 and then g5. And white uh, crashes through on the king's side. Uh, the way to at least create problems for white uh, was to take on d5 here, and white objectively is better here, but he would have to play very precisely and he would have to calculate, which is something that Magnus, I think in general, uh, throughout that game, uh, his approach was to restrict the counterplay as much as possible and only calculate when calculation leads to immediate victory. Um, and here the choice for white is between uh, just taking on d5 and after knight f6 playing something like bishop c4, after which he is still probably better uh, for tactical reasons. If, if, if black takes on a4, you can play knight g5, h6, you take on f7, king takes, and now you play bishop d3, attacking the bishop on a4, and also attacking this uh, pawn on h6. And white is actually very, very significantly better. But it's not an easy uh, variation to first of all spot, and secondly, correctly assess, because in this position, for the time being, black is a full pawn, full piece up, and. Uh, you have to be very, very sure that uh, you're winning here to go for it. Or after cd5, Magnus could have gone knight g5. And here, uh, knight f6 is more or less strictly the only move. Uh, you don't even want to contemplate going f6, knight e6. This is a very, very horrible position for black. You, you don't want to be playing that. So knight f6, rook f3, h6. And here... Uh, once again, white has to go for direct operations. He takes on f7, king takes, you take on h6, queen h8, uh, queen d2. And in this position, black has a choice of either a significantly worse position after g4, g5, bishop f5, and gf, which once again, uh, I think it's easier to see for the machine just how, how better white is after queen takes f6 and rook f4. The answer is white is very, very very much better, but uh, as we discussed during the, the live show, uh, for a human being, this position does not immediately appear to be completely clear, to be honest. Uh, or black can play king e7, after which white just goes c takes d5 and says, yes, I'm a full piece down for the time being, but your pieces are so completely discoordinated here that my compensation is uh, more than enough. Uh, and I don't know which one of those two options Magnus would have chosen here, but cd5 would actually create uh, significant uh, conversion uh, conversion problems for him. Lev, on the other hand, uh, down to something like, I believe, seven minutes at this moment, uh, played king g7, to which Magnus replied with uh, rook b3. Instead of rook b3, uh, he had a very strong option in knight g5, which more or less forces queen f6. And now you can take... King takes f6, knight takes h7 doesn't really uh, work for black at all because this is, not only have you lost the h7 pawn, you also allow rook e7 and white is just completely winning. So black has to take with the knight, rook e7, rook f8 is more or less the only move. 
and now after bishop g2 which is maybe not the easiest move in the world to find but still uh, the threat of knight e6 and in general threats uh, to the black queen side make sure that black is in a lot of trouble but the, the move Magnus made uh, does not really ruin anything at all and I think it also had a practical advantage of not being what Lev expected which led to Lev uh, burning more time and committing uh, mistakes further down, down the road rook b3 the pawn on b7 is attacked rook b8 is very natural and now Magnus goes knight g5 and here, the only way not to lose on the spot was to play queen f6. Uh, the queen goes back. This, I think, is the point of rook b3 more than anything else. Uh, compared to this position after knight g5, queen f6, white does have the option of returning with the queen because the rook on e3 is not in the way. So queen f6, white has uh, queen d2, creating a threat of rook f3, also hinting that the pawn on a5 is hanging, uh, h6, knight e4, Let's say queen d8 and white just goes rook f3 and black is completely tied down and uh, is in trouble basically uh, everywhere on the board so white retains a very very large advantage here but the move uh levon made uh, knight f6 basically just loses on the spot and it didn't take magnus very long to realize that he played rook f3 uh, and the threat currently is queen d4 and this pin will basically cost black a great deal of material. Even if you play something, sorry, even if you play something like queen e7, rook e3, queen f8, even here after queen d4, basically uh, this knight on f6 uh, is, is a dead man standing and uh, it will get picked up after white gets uh, his knight e4, rook f3 maneuver in. And the move Levon made, which is h6, he played it on uh, very little tie remaining. It loses to a number of things, but what Magnus did is the cleanest, knight e4, knight takes e4 only move, queen takes f7, king h8 and queen takes g6. And Levon just resigned here because uh, uh, rook f7 is the immediate threat. If you go knight g5, white takes on h6 with check and then goes rook f6 and there's really no defense against uh, rook g6 mate. Uh, and uh, Black has to start giving up a ton of material just to not get mated immediately. And the only move to not get mated would be to play Queen g5, after which White just picks up a full knight on e4 and is uh, two pawns up with continuing attack against the, the exposed Black King. So it's very understandable why Levon did not feel like he has to continue here. A very, very nice uh, uh, victory by uh, the world champion. Uh, in particular, if you consider just how uh, well acquainted with these types of structures Levon is in general and how little it is expected to give white to go from seemingly not really aiming for very much here uh, and like seven moves later, uh, the position is, as we've come to realize slowly as the game progressed, the position, this position is already very, very unpleasant. And it has been converted into a full point, I think, uh, uh, in a very exemplary fashion by, by Magnus. So all in all, uh, I think a virtuoso performance by, by the world champion, who with this victory remains the only person in the field of Norway Chess 2018 who won the game. And he is a full point ahead of the field after round three, which is not something you say very often. He has two and a half out of three. Nobody else is in plus, and there are two people in the minus, uh, Fabiano and Levon, two people who played him with black. Round four of uh, Altibox Norwich S2018 is tomorrow, so be sure to tune in to our continued uh, premium coverage on uh, chess24.com. Uh, thank you for watching. This has been Peter Svidler for Chess24.